Welcome everyone to our session today. It's great to have you as part of the audience. Um, and first, I wanted to thank you all again just for joining and taking time out of your SOCAP conference to listen in to both this panel and pitch session today. And I also want to thank our ICM member panelists who you will meet in just a few minutes and the amazing entrepreneurs for participating in the pitches that you'll hear. So ICM, or Impact Capital Managers, for those of you who are not familiar with the organization, is a member network for funds based in North America who are investing for positive impact and to maximize financial returns. So while none of the investors you're going to hear from today actually are members of the ICM internal team, we are all a part of teams at member funds who have joined the ICM network to support its mission. And as you'll get a sense from the small sample size of investors you're going to meet today, ICM's member funds cover a wide range of sectors and impact and investment themes across all of our work, as well as stage-wise, we're very diverse too. So everything from early stage seed investors all the way up through later stage uh, buyout funds as well. So a really broad set of investors who have backed ICM and joined the network, and we're excited to dig in to understand the strategies behind a couple of those today, as well as meet some exciting entrepreneurs. So today, just lastly on Impact Capital Managers, before we get started, the network has grown to over 70 member funds in its short five-year history and represents over 13 billion in impact-focused capital. So I encourage all participants in the audience to take a look at the Impact Capital Managers website at some point, and you can see a great roster of all of our member funds that have joined to date as well as research and articles and programmatic efforts that ICM has launched um, and more to come as we continue to work together. So to introduce myself, my name is Emma Sisman and I am with SJF Ventures. Uh, SJF actually is a fund that helped co-found ICM when it was first getting started some years ago. And at SJF, we invest in what we call high growth positive impact companies that span a broad range of sectors that are both environmentally focused as well as socially focused. So everything from clean energy to circular economy and sustainable foods on the environmental side. And on the more social or societal side, we invest in companies in health and wellness, education, employment technologies, gov tech. So really a, a broad set of themes that we're, we're looking to tackle. And over our 20 plus year history, we've backed 75 portfolio companies to date. And most recently, raised our fifth fund at the beginning of 2021. That was $175 million in size. So looking to deploy capital actively, as well as all the other investors who you're about to meet. So really, if, if anything sounds like it might be a fit for your company or for your work, please feel free to reach out to us after the session. We're looking to engage with any members of the audience where there might be a good fit for a conversation. So before we jump into our pitches and our panel, I wanted to give our other panelists an opportunity to introduce themselves. So maybe we will start with Stephen. If you could give a bit on your background and experience as well as your work at Bronze, that would be great. Yeah, happy to do that, Emma. Thank you. Uh, my name is Stephen DeBerry. I'm at Bronze Investments. Bronze was also one of the founders of uh, Impact Capital Managers that really support this organization. Um, we are a social impact focus venture capital fund. And we focus on the areas of uh, domestic US where there is structural historical disparity, which is basically everywhere. Um, and we're looking to move those disparities to prosperity. Um, and so companies that have a product or service uh, where you know, revenue for the company is driving impact uh, is our sweet spot. Uh, that we're agnostic about category, but we tend to see a lot in health, uh, financial services, education, food, transportation, et cetera, uh, areas, you know, we see marginalization in our society. Um, so glad to be here. Also, folks, um, you know, think they have uh, products and services that align with us. I'd be happy to talk with folks after this session and really glad to be here. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Stephen, for joining us. And next, Sasha, would be great to hear a bit about your background and work at Ecosystem Integrity Fund. Sure. So um, Ecosystem Integrity Fund, or perhaps um, for those of you who like efficiency of syllables, you can just call us EIF. Uh, we are a fund focused exclusively on environmental sustainability. Um, that's the expertise and backgrounds of all of the partners. We're all lifers, passionate about finding solutions to sustainability, and have been investing in um, venture 
uh, for um, the better part of a couple decades now pursuing um, environmental uh, businesses. That crosses everything from uh, what what you might traditionally think of as clean tech, so enabling technologies for um, distributed solar and other renewables to things like consumer products that um, are driven by more sustainable ingredients um, that are lower impact on on people on the planet, uh, to things like stormwater control efficiency across HVAC. So um, diverse set of industries all driven by where we see the opportunity for incremental advancement of more sustainable systems. Uh, we're on fund four currently, which is a $250 million fund. Um, we're probably a, about halfway through deployment of that fund and looking for more investments. And one of the really exciting things that we've seen as we've done this work over um, the past uh, you know, 15 plus years is that what started out as um, what others looked at as a kind of um, bizarre niche thing has become I, I, I dare say cool all of a sudden that there's a lot of activity in, in our sector. And it's so exciting because there's so much that we need to be doing and so many different kinds of founders who we want to be supporting across more and more different spaces. And so um, we're really excited about the breadth of what we plan to do with this fund and future funds and super excited to meet um, the entrepreneurs and hear the pitches and in this session and beyond. So thank you all. Yeah. Thanks, Sasha. And last but not least, Laura, if you could give someone your work at TCEF, that would be great. Yeah, um, great. Thanks so much, Emma and SOCAP, for having us all here today um, to talk about uh, kind of this really important subject. I'm Laura Metcalf. I'm a venture partner at the Social Entrepreneurs Fund, or TSEF, TSEF, as we say. Um, and TSEF is an early stage venture fund focused on increasing access and economic opportunity for low to moderate income populations. Um, the third fund we're investing out of right now is focused all on the United States. Um, and we really believe that um, it's expensive to be poor in the United States. And so by investing in companies using software or SaaS platforms to ease, um, increase access or to ease some of those costs, we can have um, significant impact on, um, on uh, the, the working poor um, and the poor's lives here in the U.S. Um, we invest in three verticals, inclusive fintech, that might be alternative credit scoring mechanisms, um, things that uh, increase access to credit, um, digital health, um, things are uh, looking at um, apps or platforms that help manage chronic um, health conditions that tend to uh, significantly or disproportionately um, impact low-income um, people, and then human services tech. So platforms that help, um, you know, the big social service systems, workforce development work better. Um, and uh, the one thing I would mention that we're quite proud of is that 60% of our portfolios um, have a women or minority um, founder or CEO. So um, we still think we need to do better. And we I know we're going to talk about that in this panel of how we all try to really make sure that we are open to finding um, founders from di uh, diverse and different backgrounds. Um, but that's something that we believe at least we've started that journey and, and we'll look to do more of. Great. Thank you, Laura. So as Laura mentioned that, you know, diversity and, and making sure we're supporting underrepresented founders and, and having opportunities to, you know, receive investment from funds like ours and the broader investment community is a priority for all of us and what we're here to talk about today. And so we wanted to kick off with some questions to the panelists around deal flow and deal flow strategies. And, you know, every fund talks about kind of their secret sauce to how they find exciting deals that fit their model uniquely and where they're finding those deals and you know through inbound, outbound networks, technology platforms that can support finding deals. So wanted to throw out a question to the group here on exactly that. What is it that makes kind of your deal flow fund strategy unique? And how are you finding those diamond in the roughs, especially around supporting you know, underrepresented founders, entrepreneurs, company leaders? in the work that you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. So maybe perhaps Sasha, if you want to kick off, that would be great. Sure. So I think, you know, you, you listed a bunch of sources and the answer for most of us is probably all of the above. Um, and I, I think that if, if I am forced to name a, a secret sauce uh, beyond just anything and everything is, uh, I think, and this is probably true for uh, most of the folks who, um, 
are, are on this panel and other panels today is that like this this is our life's work. We've been doing this a really long time. And so building a network um, in a short amount of time doesn't doesn't really work. Um, this is something that we have been at uh, for years and years and years. And so the um, depth of um, technical exposure and um, companies that have been built and entrepreneurs and other team members that have moved on to other things, there's a, there's a, a really rich sort of tapestry of individuals that we have the privilege of working with. And that is uh, tremendously valuable to building um, deal flow going forward. Having said that, I think, you know, one of the things we recognize um, is that you know, you're in a way um, limited by your existing networks. And so when we look at earlier portfolios and we don't see as many underrepresented founders as we would like to, you know, we're, we're incredibly proud that Fund4 looks very different, that, you know, about half of our founders are um, underrepresented in Fund4, which is not something we can say about earlier funds. And I think that that comes from pushing ourselves um, to not just rely on the networks that we have in place today and not just rely on traditional um, deal flow generation. And um, that's that's been a really um, exciting journey as we kind of go outside of our comfort zone and outside of what comes easily to us and just looking under the streetlights for the deals that happen to be to be coming through the existing um, network. So um, let me pause there and make sure we leave enough time for everyone to jump in. Sure. Stephen, how about at Bronze? What, what's some of the work that you all do to, to find great deals? Yeah, this has always been an interesting question for me because um, I, I honestly wouldn't say we do anything particular to try to attract, attract founders of color. Um, although our fundamental reason for being is to impact communities that are on the margin. So I think our, our strategy is what attracts folks um, at the high level. But I think, you know, if you, if you peel back a layer or two, you know, what we really try to do is be authentic in that pursuit, you know, um, radically authentic. Like we're really real. Um, and we play for love. We think that love is a competitive advantage. And that's a thing that I think most investors don't talk about. And uh, we know from experience, both as entrepreneurs and investors, that the path to building a company is so hard that if you don't have an irrational preoccupation with doing it, if you're not playing for love on some level, you're probably not gonna win. Um, you'll give up. Giving up is the rational thing to do. You have to be irrationally uh, committed. And so I think you know we are that, and I think like attracts like. So we've never really had, a, I mean, knock on Fort Micah or whatever this is, you know, we've never really had a, an opportunity, a, a challenge with deal flow. We just like keep it real and grind super hard and we play for people that we love. Yeah. I love the word you use around your authenticity as a firm and making sure that that comes across in, in your work and that attracts folks kind of from an inbound perspective um, to give some input on SJF's strategy. Something that we talk a lot about is our scrappiness. And I think that that kind of leads to being our authentic selves as well. So, you know, all levels of the firm, you know, cold outreach, trying a bunch of different email addresses to try to reach a founder of a company we're excited about and think might be aligned with what we do. And a lot of that just comes from researching the markets that we're, we're active in and trying to find any and all companies that might be uh, relevant to a question that we're looking to solve or a thesis that we're, we're trying to, you know, solve out. And so, uh, that that app outbound scrappiness, you know, emails ten different ways. Um, I think hopefully comes across um, as are authentic for us and and telling our story about um, you know being involved in the impact space for a long time and trying to be kind of public with our our impact work and and sharing those results of our our prior investments is also a story that we really like to tell to new companies as we get to know them. And Laura, how about you at at TSEF, what, um, what are some of the ways that you're finding exciting deals? Yeah, no, I love everything that you guys have said. And, and it's probably worth noting, similar to Stephen, um, we are not, our, part of our thesis is not to invest in diverse founders, but I think it's because of the nature of the problems that the founders um, we engage with are trying to solve. They often have had life experience um, 
Um, and that's, you know, that's what's motivated them or given them the passion to solve the problem. And, and sadly, because we are focused on um, uh, low to moderate income, you tend to see an overrepresentation of, um, of BIPOC people and, um, and, and women, you know, conquering these problems. And so, um, for us, I think we really um, stood back um, probably two or two and a half years ago and said, how do we not fall into the trap? of just taking deal flow from our networks as expansive as they are, because I think that is inherently biased to who we know um, and, and who we are. And so how do we make sure we're leaning beyond those networks or really trying to be open to new relationships? And so I would say that for the past couple of years, we've just really tried to embrace different sources. And that, that means a lot of kind of volunteer work in terms of like, we're, you know, we're judging, I'm judging mass challenge. We're engaged with universities ranging from MIT to Columbia to um, a couple in Texas. Um, uh, somebody on our team is a village capital mentor and judge. And so really it's just like trying to put ourselves in different situations or with groups of people that we wouldn't necessarily spend every day with, or we haven't known historically um, just to make sure that we are trying to be really open. Uh, and we, and we respond to incoming, honestly, like incoming, um, incoming, uh, inquiries via LinkedIn, via our website. Um, we, we try to be really good about, um, you know, taking, taking a quick look and saying, Hey, yeah, this does fit our thesis or it doesn't. And, and going from there. So I don't think there's any rocket scientists that, or there's no like, you know, secret, sauce, like, you know, like Sasha said, it's really a bunch of hard work and trying to be open every single day. Sure. That's great. And we just have a couple minutes before we're going to get into the meat of our session, which is hearing from our amazing entrepreneurs who have joined us today. But quickly, one last question for each of you. Um, when you are speaking with, you know, one of the many entrepreneurs that you talk to on a day to day basis uh, in pitches and conversations, to get to know companies, what is one or two things that stand out to you in a great pitch? Um, we're about to hear from some great entrepreneurs, but for those of the audience members who are entrepreneurs themselves, any tips uh, to what makes um, a great pitch to a panel or one investor like any of ourselves? Steven, maybe I'll start with you. Yeah, I'll jump on that because I think it's an extension of what I was just talking about. I, I, I'm looking for someone who has a unique insight based on their life experience or some other thing, you know, uh, it's kind of like a PhD student at a point, they know more about their topic than their advisor. That's how you get a PhD. I, I look for founders that are smarter than me about something. And I'm looking for that reason why, you know, to believe that they're going to go all the way across the line, you know, with the company. Yeah. I, I, uh, I, I worry about the uh, metric of um, founders who are smarter than me about something because I think that that's like there's there's a lot of those right um, most founders are um, but I, I I think that you know you can you can give obviously your pitch has to be well informed and then you got to distill it down into bite sizes that um, we can understand and we understand your topic way less well than you do um, generally but the the I think you know where I thought you were gonna go uh, Stephen was um, in your earlier comment, your discussion about authenticity and love and like the, the, the feeling that we get from entrepreneurs about just passion about their, their topic coupled with that knowledge is so important because we know that that's such a difficult job and it's exciting and it's wonderful. And we, we get really excited about building something together. And, um, I think probably you're not in those shoes to begin with, if you don't have that passion. Um, but that, that authentic interest in addition to knowledge in really building something, um, that we all are aligned on wanting to build together, um, is super important when we, when we listen to your story and, um, dig into it with you. I think we're violently agreeing. <laughs> yeah. Laura, any last comments to add? The only thing I would add that um, TCEF, um, and in addition to what Stephen and Sasha have said, which I totally agree with, um, TCEF loves to look for these kind of win-win situations. So where, um, you know, where a portfolio company has found a way to offer something inexpensively or even free to um, their, you know, uh, one target client, but has found somebody else who finds value in that to pay on the other side. And so an example of that would be Aunt Bertha, which is the largest social service database in the United States. Um, 
and they offer that free. Anyone can go to their website right now and put in your zip code. And if if your grandmother needs a ride to the doctor, you know, because she doesn't have family around or somebody needs food help, um, you can find all that. Um, the way they found to pay for that is that um, hospital systems and healthcare systems post ACA had significant incentives to um, help people live uh, healthy and stable lives, not just release from the, them from the ER and, and, you know, the homeless diabetic, you can treat the diabetes, but if that person's homeless, they're going to be back in your ER next week. And so hospitals in the last few years have begin, become much bigger proponents of helping stabilize people's lives in the community. And so they're willing to pay for that Aunt Bertha data um, and um, and process. Um, and so we love situations like that, where you, you find a, a a, a customer who has a business reason to pay for something, but at the same time, there's all this other social good being spit off. Um, and so, it, you know, those types of business models, like we, it's like catnip for us. We love them. Great. Well, I'm sure, sure we're going to hear about some win-wins in these next couple pitches we'll be listening to. Um, so for the audience's benefit, just an overview of what you're about to see, we are going to have four Entrepreneurs join us um, from Go Coach, Varuna, Honest Jobs, and Mentor Spaces. And each entrepreneur will have a couple minutes to give their pitch and, and give a description of the business model and value proposition and history of the company. And then we'll move into a couple minutes of short Q&A from us as panelists uh, at our investment funds. And then we'll go to the next entrepreneur. So we'll keep it short and sweet and moving forward, but we're really excited to have these four companies join us. And we will be kicking off with Christy McCann Flynn from Go Coach. So Christy, excited to, to hear from you. Hi there. Hi, Emma. Hi, I'm Christy. I'm a CEO and co-founder of Go Coach. I'm uh, thrilled to be here and would love to be able to dive in to let you know how we're bringing equitable, continuous education for all. So I'm just going to share my screen. Um, and go here. So what is Go Coach? Go Coach is a B2B SaaS subscription talent development platform. And what we're doing is that we're trying to bring continuous education at scale for everyone. So there's two core reasons why I created Go Coach. is that one, I'm a former HR executive. And as a former HR executive for 20 years, I watched us throw out people left and right due to lack of skills. We have replaced and recycled everyone where now we have a war on talent, a skill shortage, great resignation, and much more. We have caused this trillion dollar problem and we're here to be able to solve for that. Second, as a former HR executive, there wasn't a way for me to be able to see all my different types of employees from all different types of walk of life and really where their gaps are, to actually have an end-to-end -end solution that really meets people where they're at, that understands where those gaps in development areas and, and is able to measure and, and manage that progress across the way. So that's what Go Coach does. We're, we're much bigger than a, a match.com for coaches. We're actually meeting people where they are to be able to understand what those gaps are in a very personalized way and to be able to manage to get to goal progression, actually be able to measure it. So essentially our platform works much differently than what's out in the market right now, which is, you know, there's a lot of match.coms, you know, with coaches, there's a lot of content candy stores where they have tons of content, but nobody knows where to start. And then there's the traditional LMSs that are just a lot of work for both the users and the buyers in order to be able to get that personalization of learning. So we use AI, but also self-selection. So we're really meeting people where they're at and understanding those skills and those gaps and really honing development plans that's managed all through our platform for all the different types of users, the coach, the coachee, the manager, and the stakeholder. And it's actually getting to that overall progression. Right now we have what's actually at 1.3 ARR. Um, we have 100% client retention and user adoption, and we have 70 plus clients that are growing. And then just within our current market team, it's over 74 million. What's really unique about what we're doing, and, and I think Laura had mentioned this earlier, is that we have a lot of clients that have a lot of money and, and that we're tapping into those services to be able to continue to hone all their employees to make sure that everyone has equitable access to GoCoach. And then on the other side, we're also working with higher ed, online universities, nonprofits to be able to give GoCoach at a fraction of the cost. And so we're, we're taking from the well-paying clients to be able to serve 
the ones that don't have that money uh, up front that's helping the underserved and underprivileged. And so everybody has access to GoCoach at the end of the day to continue to be able to hone their skills, to be able to develop and own their career. So our major differentiation, as I said, is that we're an all-in-one solution. We have 100% adoption rate because we actually make money off of people using our platform. Traditional platforms out there in the L&D space make money off of people not using them. That is very different. We want to be able to educate people and actually take that change behavior and be able to measure it. We serve all different types of clients and all different types of customers from all walks of life and really continue to push the blended learning to be able to connect to rewards and actually change behavior. And these are some of the results that are aggregate from our overall platform of the increase of change behavior, understanding, be able to communicate with others, getting to that overall goal achievement and making progress. It's a land and expand model. And, and these are companies right now that offer equitable go coach to every single one of their employees. And so where they started off small, they've expanded significantly because we made it affordable and accessible for everybody to have that opportunity to continue to hone their career. This is where we are right now. Um, we're looking at doing two forum bookings by the end of the year um, of bringing in one five revenue, and we're going to continue the build um, with, within this model. As we continue to tap into higher ed, uh, because that has been a huge vertical that we've been working on with online universities, community colleges, and state schools, we're going to continue to push equitable go coach while major corporations are paying more of, of the higher price tags uh, to make sure that there's access for everybody. This is my team that's remote everywhere. We're experts within HR tech and um, uh, uh, education tech. And we're actually oversubscribed of, as of today. Um, so, you know, we raised uh, over what we were supposed to at the two and a half at uh, three and a half. Um, and we're still looking to take a few uh, checks from investors that believe in education and believe in equity of access for all. So that's me in a nutshell and go coach. Thank you. Thanks, Christy. Wait for our investor judges to come back in. And thank you for staying so prompt. You stayed right on schedule. So um, appreciate that. But for, for our investors on the line, any initial questions, comments for Christy as we take a couple minutes for feedback? I'll jump in. Congratulations on being oversubscribed, Christy. That's uh, something not a lot of entrepreneurs get to say. If you had access to more capital, would you take it? And if so, what would you do with it? Yeah, we would definitely take it right now um, for a couple of different reasons. I mean, we were bootstrapped. Um, so I actually created Go Coach uh, with my own money that I actually got from companies that did not do the right thing um, when it came to sexual harassment, discrimination, bullying, and a lot more. And I'm a former HR exec, so you could probably figure out how I got that money. <laughs> I said no, uh, but I want to invest that money into something. And, and that was, you know, this equitable education for everyone. And so we've been kind of acting like an incognito series A. So we're going to continue to take on that capital right now. Uh, this market is huge, but everybody is looking at it as far as giving access to people that already have access to a lot of opportunity. We're looking at it, giving to access to people that traditionally wouldn't have that opportunity. Um, and so why the iron side, we're going to take that and continue to bring in a CFO, a head of marketing, and probably more sales and, and tech and development. I'd love to um, jump in and just um, on on two things. One, and if you could just talk a little bit more, are you a marketplace where you're actually bringing together corporates and then on the other side, higher education and, and other types of learning institutions? And then the second thing, if there's time, I'd love to understand a little bit about how you're thinking about your impact measurement. And I, I, I saw those numbers quickly kind of come across the screen. I'd love to understand a little bit about that as well. Right. Um, so right now we're treating higher ed and corporations as two different verticals. They have the same challenges with overall engagement, retention, um, you know, I mean, and, and skill shortages. And what we're seeing, particularly on the higher ed side, especially with we're only working with online universities, state schools and community colleges. We want to get the underserved and underrepresented ASAP to give them a leg up and actually bring applicability to their degree and make them more employable because that's the issue. Um, it's not that the issue that there isn't skills, it's how you get out there and, and how you really start to hone your career. And so we're treating them as two separate, separate verticals right now, but the idea is to converge them together to essentially not only be a coach marketplace, but be a talent marketplace for these individuals to be able to tap into a lot of the corporations that we're working with. So separate now going to converge on, on the roadmap later. 
And there was a second part of your question, Laura. I'm sorry. Well, Sasha, I'm I'm happy to let you go if you have another one. And then no, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I, I just love to understand a little bit about how you're measuring your impact. Are you doing kind of pre-post surveys or um, versus published studies or or yeah, say a little bit more? Yeah, as far as the impact, as far as the change behavior, we it's ongoing data. So we're getting a current state assessment as to where they're up right now and then how they're progressing. You know what I mean? With all the feedback from the coach, the coachee, the manager and stakeholder to get to that change progression. So it's all oriented in data. As far as the actual impact, it's really looking at the number of learners from each, you know, uh, sector, like naming, like we have, like, you know, some corporate, you know, Fortune 500, but we also have a, a bunch of nonprofits so that we're able to, you know, give GoCoach at a discount. As we tap in the higher ed, we're going to see those learners go up significantly uh, with some of the deals uh, that, that we're working on currently within Q4. And so that's really going to help us. Like if we can triple our learners with one online university that's helping over 8,000 students, you know, I mean, that, that that's going to be a significant jump from where we are right now with our corporations. Mm-hmm. So what's if you if you. um uh, fully realize if we look five, 10 years down the road, what is what does success look like to you? What is your vision for for what this company can become? What would make you you know really happy looking back on today, you know, five, 10 years down the road? Yeah, that, that, that everybody has access to GoCoach. Um, as an HR executive for over 20 years, the, the, the lies we told ourselves, nobody's good enough. You know, what I mean, nobody has the skills like, you know, what I mean, you can't find that, you know, the right people. No. We just wanted to shove people in a box and, and if they didn't perform, then we got rid of them instead of actually honing, you know, I mean, those skills. And so I don't want people to be disposable anymore. I want people to be accessible and to be able to continue, you know, their education from whether they get, get at the college degree or not, um, that, that they have that ability and agility to do so. Because, you know, a lot of what's missing within the workforce and has been missing for the last 20 years are these human schools. How to critically think, you know, what I mean, what it means to actually communicate and collaborate, understanding the difference of a people and opinion. These are the most important skills right now that that are constantly lacking and that are causing the biggest problems within our world. Yeah, Christine, I guess a follow on question to that. Um, you just touched on some of the different skill sets that users are building upon. So curious. One, what where have you seen the most traction? Is it in communication You know, tools? Is it in? leadership development, just curious from a content perspective, how how you've seen folks respond, users respond. And then mm-hmm. a second part of the question too, around coaching, just curious on the scalability there, you know, how much is actually a human helping with coaching versus online content that they can work through in modules where it's more technology based. So getting a sense of the divide there between human versus tech. Yeah, absolutely. So as far as the skills, regardless of industry, um, or, or vertical or anything like that. And ir- irregardless of the level of the employee, entry level to executive level, it's five predominant skills that have been consistent pre and post COVID. Number one being change management, how to deal with a lot of the um, um, ambiguity and what's in it for me factor for any type of change within an organization, which could be growing, restructuring, resizing, what have you. Number two is communication. Three is collaboration. Four is situational leadership across, up and down how to be able to manage those relationships with your peers, your managers, and those that may report to you. And the fifth one is diversity, equity, inclusion. What is it? What do I need to learn? How do I become more equitable? How do I understand and communicate with people's differences? So they all go hand in hand. Um, and they're, they're all tagging at this, you know, remote world we're in right now. And then as far as, you know, what we're looking to do, um, you know, I mean, at, at, with the, the, the platform is that it's blended. So we have a coach marketplace and learning experience platform. And the learning experience platform is proprietary content built off all those data themes. That's constantly reinforcing like a textbook, you know, I mean, what they're learning within those individual sessions. The more coaches we have, the more skills we have. And, and that's where it becomes very sticky because, you know, people are coming back year over year going through those top five skills but we're going to continue to evolve as technology evolves. And so everything is done on the platform, you know, I mean, irregardless if it's a person or, you know, I mean, a module popping up to them and it's very targeted based on where they're at right now. It's not generic, like a lot of other L and D platforms where it's just like, Oh, Emma, here's a coach for communication. Good luck. It's very prescriptive to what the data is telling us and where the data is going to actually be able to get them there. Got it. And, and beyond, um, one more question, I guess, following on there. Beyond 
where they are today. So, you know, I might be working at a clean energy company and I might be at point A as an associate. And, you know, you have a CEO at an education company also participating and they might be way far down the line, but is the core curriculum that you've built the same for every kind of user? So would I, as an associate, be going through the same curriculum as a CEO at a company in an entirely different space? Yeah, potentially. I mean, it, it's it's where they're at. I mean, what we're finding is that the skills um, are very consistent, regardless of the level. The lack of skills are very consistent, <laughs> regardless of the level. Um, and, and it's, you know, I guess one of the reasons that why everybody complains about managers is that, you know, I mean, they don't have the skills. Well, of course they didn't, because their managers didn't have the skills. And so we, we've got to this boiling point. And so what we're finding is that we're not forcing it. it. It's actually a natural learning curve, irregardless of where they are right now. Um, and so, you know, in the way that it's targeted, they could see where those gaps are. And it's only going to recommend things that fill those gaps um, rather than something, once again, that isn't targeted or generic. So it's about change behaviors. That's what we're looking to do. That's the outcome. Uh, and, and that's what we're measuring against. Great. Well, thank you so much, Christy. I think we're we're up at time, but really appreciate both the, the pitch and the deck and overview and answering some of our questions. So thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you. Have a good one, guys. Great job, thank Christy. You. So next we will be hearing from Shay Fabode at Varuna. So Shay, welcome and we're excited to learn more. Thanks so much, Emma. And um, hi, everyone. I'll just pull up my my uh, slides here. Give me a couple of seconds. First of all, thanks for having me um, at the session. My name is Shay Fabode, CEO and co-founder at Varuna. And um, at Varuna, we provide what we like to call visibility, insights, and awareness to water systems so they can deliver clean water consistently. Um, we all know of the, the flints of the world, situations with high level of water contamination that catches the attention of, of the country and the world. What we don't know is that there are hundreds of violations that happen across water systems daily in the US. And while they might not catch the attention like Flint, they are still consequential, negatively consequential to the people who experience these bore water warnings. Because what they really mean is the water system that is ordering you to boil the water coming out of your tap has admitted to not knowing what's in the water and is handing off responsibility to you. And the reason why they do this unfortunately, is because they lack visibility into the real-time state of water quality beyond the water treatment plant. They ship the water out of the plant and essentially send a technician on a truck to go take a sample if they think there's a problem or if a customer calls to say, oh, our water smells or tastes funny. And these locations where they're sending the technician to are what we like to call blind spots. And unfortunately, um, there's this stark overlap, one-to-one -one relationship between the prevalence of these boil water warnings and parts of the country where you have um, higher minority populations. It probably doesn't surprise you. This is as much a, an operational issue as it is a social justice issue. And the blind spot tend to open up in places where you might have crumbling infrastructure, or distant locations from the water treatment plant itself. So what we do at Verona is we deploy these beacons, as we call them, these nodes into those blind spots. They are affordable, parameter-driven um, sensors that are self-powered. We pull the data into simple dashboards to alert a technician if there's a problem, provide them the optimal workflows to address the problem, and as we capture more data, we start to predict possible contamination issues in the water system.
And what this allows us to do is serve those markets that I've mentioned to you, those places where um, minorities tend to be the predominant uh, dwellers in either parts of a city or in the city itself or a town. And we prevent their violations, increase the efficiency of the technician, and improve decision-making for resource allocation. We call it 100 times the visibility, eyes where they didn't have it before, and 40% um, increase in their ability to address their operational needs. We sell it as software as a service. The hardware is baked into the cost, and we start with pilot engagements um, that then roll into us building out a digital representation of the water system for the utility or the uh, commercial entity. A big market, as much as it's a problem, I think someone mentioned earlier, as much as it's a problem, it's an opportunity. It's a huge market as we continue to see uh, increasing need for updated technology and infrastructure to manage our water systems. And what we've chosen to do is create a new category. It's blind spots. Current solutions are expensive and binary. They either tell you there's something or not. There's, there's no, oh, your water is trending towards um, uh, uh, chlorine residuals dropping too low and there might be contamination. No. Most tools currently just tell you one thing, and if that thing is in there, unfortunately, uh, you end up with the contamination problems we prevent at Veruna. And um, our implementation is converging with just a greater awareness of the need for um, action in this area. And that is showing up in new contracts, um, increasingly in cities, even large cities that are looking to deploy an affordable advanced technology solution to their minority residents and consequently to the whole city as well. Um, myself, I've been in the utility industry for about 20 years. And this started when my wife and my son started to have adverse effects to the water we're drinking when we moved to Texas. My co-founder, Jamil Carter, he's done sales into government for the bulk of his career. I worked in power utilities as an operations engineer, and we've wrapped ourselves um, with just experts in the fields we need them in, IoT and AI, dev, and investors that believe in the mission of Veruna which is over the next couple of years to serve at least 45 million people with 10,000 units of Varuna, um, ensuring clean, consistent water for really everyone is who we plan to, but we have a clear goal knowing the communities in the US where the problem currently exists and we're doing the work to serve those communities. Thank you. Should we jump? Sure. Um, See, so yeah, I've got uh, a couple of questions. I think this is really interesting business. Um, Thank you. I, yeah, uh, man, we need this kind of thing for sure. Um, I've got two questions. One is, what are the buyers like? You know, I, I because I've seen various solutions not dissimilar to this that we do need. We need to have them deployed in the communities, but especially at the municipal level, if that's the customer. Even though it's rational, they don't buy. So yeah. I would love to understand what the buyer behavior is yeah. um, and how that may have been impacted by the infrastructure bill. Um, and then my second question is, once you hit your 10,000 units, you reach your 45 million people in what? Uh, global domination. I'll answer the second one first. But um, in all seriousness, though, we, we targeted 45 million because... And it actually ties to the first question. Thanks for both. The way we've essentially gone to market is um, found that map I showed you is, is the um, overlap between where violations currently happen and where communities of color um, are increasing in, in number. So what we then do with that list, because there's a list behind the map, is 
we essentially customize, quote unquote, the, the pitch to that city. We know you're in violation. We know there's a consent decree that unfortunately is not being implemented here. But at the end of the day, you do want to provide clean water to your customers. Otherwise, um, you don't um, continue to receive either the rate increase requests you make or uh, continue to receive the support you require. So we par partner with them. We don't come as a salesperson. We partner with them because we know there's a problem. It's why we start with the pilot. It doesn't require the convoluted approval level. Uh, the pilot can be approved by the manager of the technical team, the technicians, doesn't have to go to the board. And what we found every time, except one, where we didn't fully um, uh, satisfy the use case because of where they put the node, they put it in a vault instead of in a blind spot. Every single time we've gone in with you have violations. We have a solution to allow you come out of the consent decree at a price you can afford, and we will work with you here every single time but one. We've managed to convert it into a full engagement with the water system. So that that's it's it's both a go to market, but also a like precise targeting approach taking the reluctance to take action away because we know they're already in trouble, sadly. And one, sorry, one really quick uh, follow-up. Uh, what costs more, the beacon or a violation? A violation actually costs more. Uh, that's, the, that's the wild thing. Um, but I will admit, unfortunately, the violations aren't being um, uh, penalized as they should. Some cities have have violations that they're supposed to pay fines for and they haven't. So we know that. I, I won't sit here and say we go in beating, trying to beat them over the head with, oh, you're in violation and you might have to pay this. What it does do, though, is that it takes the administration of the water system away from the team and under the city in some of these municipalities, and that they absolutely don't want. Um, could I ask a really basic question? Um, so is this akin, these sensors and these beacons, is it a, a little bit of akin to having smoke detectors at a burning house, but you still need the fire department to come in and put the fire out? Are you guys alerting them and um, to the problem, helping them target where the problem areas are? But are you also providing the solutions to the problems or is that is that a, a partnership with another organization? Yes, yeah, so it's a, it's another great question, and um, I'll answer. Uh, Stephen, did I did I answer your questions, please? Awesome, thank you. Um, fantastic question. So yes, I, I had never thought about us as um, uh, a smoke alarm, but the the I'll dive a little bit into the the solution itself. There are about five parameters that the water system knows coming from the water treatment plant. We monitor those five parameters at every point that we drop our nodes and take their historic information and essentially say, the last time the five parameters read X, you had a cluster of customers calling to say they had um, E. coli in their water. I'm using that as an example. And then we say, the inference here is you might have E. coli. These are the five steps you take. And that those actions go into the hands of the technician who gets the alert. And the reason why we've chosen this approach is because it's exactly the approach. When I, when I ran a power plant, we served about half a million residents in London. It was essentially the same thing. It allowed us to put more IoT devices in the grid and use the data converted into information instead of the approach that is currently being used where you wait for a customer to call or if you've bought a super expensive sensor, if it's a, a lead monitor, for example, if it doesn't have lead, 
it doesn't tell you anything else that's in it. You just now say you don't have lead and um, that won't won't serve in, in the future state. We need sensors everywhere um, converting signals into, into workflows. Thank you. Um, so, you know, I, I, there are so many problems with our water system and um, what you're doing makes a ton of sense. Um, and to Stephen's point, you're dealing with a customer that sometimes um, doesn't behave rationally. Yes. Um, and we've seen that over and over again. It's so frustrating, but it's, you know, it's, it's the reality of, of that world. And, and everyone's dealing with their own constraints of, you know, risk tolerance and, and various um, maybe misaligned incentives. And so I'm curious as, as you have um, learned from initial engagements and, and um, looked into building your pipeline and converting it to revenue, if you have begun to pick up on what makes a, um, what makes a more likely target customer, right? So which municipalities are more incented to um, abide by the appropriate regulations? Which ones are more comfortable that they're not actually going to be fined and, and punished in the way that, you know, technically they're supposed to be? How, how do you know who who is a more likely customer and where you're going to see uptake? Yeah, no, it's a, not a great question. So it ties to, to Stevens there. We So there's the aspiration, which is that all municipalities that have violations dive in and buy our solution. But there's also the reality, which is that um, investor-owned utility, private entities that are assigned the task of running city water systems are actually a big part of this market as well. So, for example, in Texas, there are um, just over 2,000 privately run water systems but you pay your bills to the city. And so we're not targeting the city, we're targeting those privately owned, uh, investor owned utilities who thankfully um, have, apart from the regulatory incentives to take action, they also have a business incentive to take action. So it's why I mentioned the operational efficiencies for those investor-owned utilities, the, um, there are two metrics they care about. The main one is clean water at a service level that is great. The second one is uh, a metric called required visits um, tied to violations and outages. I won't bore you with that, but it's a financial metric on their books that we directly reference in our pitch to them because we know what that is from matching their violations, the cities where they operate and their books to say, we can do X for you, reduce your violations, but also reduce your required visits and consequently um, allow you to do more with less money spent. Um, and that is a, a compelling message that we're taking to market. The last two big contracts we got were essentially that. Um, but again, we want to serve everyone. Our initial go-to-market knowing we will get deals is the um, investor-owned utilities. And then we, similar to um, the, the lady right before me, we then turn around and go get some grants to deploy our solutions to some of these municipalities because that's worked for us as well. Great. Well, thank you for the, the questions and answers. And Shay, we appreciate you taking some time to join us. Thank Great you. job. Thank you. Thank you. Good to meet you all. Great to meet you. And next, we will move to Harley Blakeman with Honest Jobs. Hey, everyone. Let me screen share. <sighs> All right. My name is, let me get started here. My name is Harley Blakeman and I am the founder and CEO of Honest Jobs. Honest Jobs is mobilizing the formerly incarcerated workforce to recapture $77 billion in annual lost earnings. 
So uh, you may not know it from my baby face, but I've been to jail a few times and I've been to prison once. Um, I unfortunately had my father pass away at a very young age. I was 15. And at that time, my mother was uh, divorced from my father and she was severely addicted to drugs and alcohol. So at that very young age of 15, I was essentially homeless, living with friends on different couches and things. And I just slipped into depression and started using drugs. Uh, started using drugs severely around 16. I dropped out of high school and really just fell into an unstable life uh, where I was using and selling drugs. And right after my 18th birthday, I was arrested and convicted of grand theft and drug trafficking in the state of Georgia. And I was sentenced to 14 months in prison. And actually, prison was one of the best things that ever happened to me. It's not your typical narrative you hear, but prison was a great uh, experience for me uh, in the sense that I got sober for the first time in three and a half years. I had time to reflect on what I wanted in life. I earned my GED. I read about 60 business books and came home with the full intent of working hard, building a career and living an honest life. Um, unfortunately, uh, when I came home, I ran into many barriers. Um, I actually put myself through community college while working at a restaurant. Then I transferred to Ohio State University where I went to business school and actually graduated top of my class with honors. I published a book that sold over 6,000 copies. But my senior year, I had 75 companies that took me through multiple rounds of interviews and I graduated unemployed. Every single company passed on me. Uh, most, I believe, are due to the background check. And the thing... About four months after gradu graduation, I was able to find a job as a production supervisor. It was a good job. I got paid well. I was very thankful. But what stuck with me and still sticks with me today is the fact that I was a white male with a great education, a support system, and many, many privileges that most people who go through our criminal justice system don't have. And I saw it as an insurmountable challenge for the majority of the people affected by our justice system. And that's why I started Honest Jobs. So the problem is pretty clear. It takes over eight months on average for someone to find employment after incarceration. And the average annual income is only 6700 a year in income. It takes half as long for a job seeker with no record to find a job. And their average income is 35000 per year. The most common solution is to work for a temp service where employees are undervalued, underpaid, and have very little upward mobility. So our results, our early data is showing some really great results. Kind of the status quo, again, is over 240 days to find a job with less than seven grand a year in income. With Honest Jobs, from the time they create an account with us to starting their first day on the job is 31 days. The average pay rate right now is just below 38000 which in most states is a decent livable wage. And why right now is such a great time to build this company, why it's a great time to invest in Honest Jobs is across the spectrum, this is the time to make this happen. Uh, political climate is great right now. House reps, legislators, even presidents all have agreed that uh, criminal justice reform is needed right now. Uh, racial justice, obviously companies everywhere are doing DE&I. There's been the, the, all the protests that we've seen happen. They are inherently tied together, uh, the inequities in our criminal justice system uh, and how that impacts people of color's ability in particular to progress in the workforce. Human Resources, the largest HR organization in the world, Society for Human Resource Management, two years ago, their key initiative was called Getting Talent Back to Work, and it was training HR uh, employees on how to hire formerly incarcerated people. This year, they launched the Getting Talent Back to Work certification. That's actually a formal certificate uh, that the Society for Human Resource Management offers. And then obviously, we're all very aware of the labor shortage and labor issues that we're having uh, at this time. So here's our product. It's a mobile-friendly web app with over 10,000 users. It's almost like any other job board, but in a couple slides, I'll be able to talk to you a little bit more about our proprietary technology and what makes us really unique. So if you see here, uh, you can see the green dots. It shows our conflicts AI score, lets you know how likely your criminal history is to directly conflict with this job. And what that translates to is how likely are you to get through the background check if you apply for this job? 
Our proprietary technology helps job seekers identify, um, my apologies, I'm repeating myself. The algorithm will consider the industry, applicable laws, EEOC guidelines, and human resource best practices. So as you can see, the kind of Venn diagram there shows what that uh, conflicts AI score is considering. And ultimately it's bringing the jobs to the top of the search results that you have the best chance of making it through the background check. And that's how we're getting people hired much faster with less rejection. Uh, so our market size is pretty enormous, uh, but I'm gonna break it down in a couple of different ways here. We think about it as by population. So there are uh, almost 67 million Americans with a criminal record, but there's about 20 million that have a felony criminal record. And if we narrow that down even more, I'm not super satisfied with the research that helped us come up with a 7.9, but if you take the number of people with felony convictions that are also considered computer literate, it's around 8 million. I think it's slightly higher than that, but that's the, the best answer I could find at this time. Uh, market size by uh, lost earnings. Again, I referenced this in the beginning, annual lost earnings due to a, a criminal record. So this is misdemeanor and felony. It's 370 billion a year in annual lost earnings due to criminal convictions. If we focus on just people with felonies, there's 77 billion lost in annual lost earnings. And then if we focus on people with felonies who are also computer literate, that's our immediate kind of opportunity is that 30.8 billion. Now, the way we think about our immediate market size is people with felony convictions that are computer literate times our average uh, placement fee so our average placement fee is about 15% of the annual pay, and that gives us about 4.6 billion. Now, our business model is pretty simple. Uh, it's a, I don't like to use the word because it's probably intimidating, but it's a bit of a three-sided marketplace. Job seekers, it's 100% free. Employers, we have a freemium model. We have free, premium, and direct placement. And then uh, our white labels are really for distribution, but it's just a kicker that we, we also make revenue off of our white labels uh, just someone said earlier, Aunt Bertha, Aunt Bertha makes money off of white labels too. We're actually one of their customers. Uh, and the white labels are very important because it's our distribution. So I think I talk more about that, but we provide white labels to a lot of people who then send us, send us job seekers who are looking for jobs. Our immediate market and our, uh, what we're hoping to target here in the next six months or so is the Second Chance Business Coalition started by Jamie Dimon uh, of J.P. Morgan Chase. This is 35 Fortune 500 companies who are committed to second chance hiring, and we believe we can make over 20 million per year off of these companies alone. Uh, our traction is pretty phenomenal. Over the last couple of months, we went through Techstars, which finished in February, and since then, uh, we are on track to break uh, 1 million ARR, or sorry, uh, yeah, 1 million ARR, hopefully this month, if not this month, next month. This is our team. Uh, we actually have hired three more people who are all three formerly incarcerated. Currently, uh, nine of our 13 employees are formally incarcerated. We've got a very diverse and committed team that are all mission aligned with us here. And then lastly is my contact info, and that's my time, eight minutes. So thank you all so much. Excited to answer your questions. Thank you, Harley. Maybe as the, the other investors are funneling in, a quick question to kick off. So you mentioned the white label. Um, and I have the benefit of knowing, you know, through prior conversations with you a little bit more detail there, but I think it would be helpful for everyone if you could touch a bit on who you're white labeling for um, and maybe, you know, the, the kind of GovTech target uh, down the line that might make sense for the organization given um, goals of governments around the country. Yeah, given the short time period for the presentation, I didn't dive into it because it would probably cause a lot more questions. But absolutely, it is an exciting part of our business model is our white label. So we kind of have a full package solution for governments. Uh, so we are negotiating multiple statewide government contracts right now where the state uh, essentially hires us to hire to help everyone coming home from incarceration find employment. So here in Colorado, we have about 65 companies across the state that use our service to hire. And we are working with the Department of Corrections and the AG's office to do basically give our product to every probation, parole and correctional facility employee. So everyone coming home is immediately plugged into a network of dozens of employers looking to hire formerly incarcerated people. We provide the tech support. We provide the customer service and uh, they basically outsource that function because uh, we have you know, very quickly been able to prove that we can do a better job than most, uh, most of your uh, government funded uh, programs in this space. And 
Uh, we're also talking, I know, uh, I think uh, Sasha uh, might be in Massachusetts. We are also negotiating a contract. Oh, sorry, Laura. We're negotiating a, a, a contract right now with Massachusetts, the executive director of public safety. Uh, and those those uh, contracts are pretty substantial. I mean, 350 grand a year. And then also they're sending us tens of thousands of users every year that, you know, our, our CAC could be negative as far as job seekers, uh, which is really exciting. Uh, and we actually have white labels with some other people as well, like really large nonprofits that serve a lot of formerly incarcerated people. So it doesn't have to be a government. It just needs to be someone who's strategic and they're really in high touch point for this population. Thank you, Emma. Um, thank you for your presentation. Super inspiring story and um, really interesting what you're doing. I'm, I'm curious um, if you are collecting data or anticipate you'll be able to collect data in the future that might inform you know, other accretive ways, so to speak, of um, helping formerly incarcerated people you know, find jobs and find um, better jobs, a target, you know, individual for companies to either target individuals who are better fits for their organization or vice versa, um, add skills, um, help help job seekers target places that are particularly rich for them and, and that they'll be happy in the long term. I could see a variety of different ways that the data that you're collecting as your user base grows might inform, um, you know, uh, 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 ways to enhance the um, experience further beyond just access. Yes, absolutely. So there's a couple things we're thinking of here. Is one is to Emma's point, the government white labels is we can then give the government data as to hey, companies are coming to us wanting to hire for these roles, but people coming home from incarceration don't have the skills to fill those jobs. So every every state has programs where they're trying to educate people behind the wall so they can come home employment ready. But it's very there's no data driving that. It's literally just like they can get a warehouse job. Let's train them on warehouse jobs. Uh, so we can use that data for policy making, for university research, for uh, a variety of things on that front. But then on the job seeker side, the white labels with states and really just being the best product for this problem will help us build a moat around a very large demographic of the workforce, almost 10 percent of the workforce. Uh, and then what we can do is our technology actually determines based on your crime how likely you are to be able to get a job. And it's getting better over time. So what we can do is we can reverse engineer that. We're actually on our roadmap is a product called Pathways, which is, hey, you tell us what you're interested in. We can show you about 200 different career paths and we can let you know how likely you are to get hired in that job if you get these skills. And we plan to partner with, you know, things like marketing and tech boot camps that are online and scalable, but also looking into a network of, you know, community colleges that can teach skill trades and things like that. So we haven't started building our education or upskilling feature yet. We really want to get our footing strong in this and really, uh, you know, make sure we're doing this as best as we can before we start to do other things. But uh, upon a Series A, we do plan on investing in uh, kind of helping people navigate to the next step in their career. There's a saying that we say in, in jails and prisons all the time is uh, to set expectations. There's the ABCs, find a job, then find a better job, then find a career. People can't come home from prison thinking they're going to find their career day one. It really is healthy for everyone if they get a job and then they start to plan for their better job and then their career. But uh, data is the big play here. Like obviously in the end goal, if we have all the data, it's, it's going to be very powerful and it's going to help the community if it's used correctly. Thank you. Thank you. Harley, there are various actors working on some variants of this. It's a big problem across the mm -hmm. country. Why are you the ones that are going to win? And how do you protect that advantage over time? Yeah. Um, I think that there have been some other people. Uh, there have been some other people who weren't necessarily product founder fit. There have been some people that kind of had gimmicky brands where they really were trying to play on a gimmick that would help them reach the audience quickly. Our brand is very trusted, honest jobs. Employers really like the tone of the way we work with them. We don't promise them the world. We try to coach them into it. So, you know, we've gotten almost 10 Fortune 500 companies doing contracts with us. We expect to do a lot more. But really, our, we've talked to investors who have invested in other kind of competitor-related companies. And our, our unique angle is both the government relationships, where we're creating that really smart funnel where we can kind of build a moat around ourselves. But also, we are the only company that I'm aware of that is at actively collecting data and improving our ability to match you with a job that we believe you have the best chance of getting. 
So our algorithm is really the thing that like right now we're acting a little bit as like a, a, um, a recruiting firm. Like we're actually helping kind of handhold people along, but all along the way, our algorithm's improving and it's getting smarter and better. So really our game plan is, is strong tech enabled from day one. We've been a, a, a tech company um, and we have half our staff as software developers. So uh, I think having a brand that isn't gimmicky, that's trusted. And ultimately we are working for HR. I know like I'm formerly incarcerated. Most of our, our employees are formerly incarcerated, but we believe that we have to serve HR and we have to serve the people who are going to hire these people. So we're not social justice warriors. We're not advocating for major law reform. What we're doing is we're operating in the system that we were given right now. And we're trying to optimize to make it easy for HR to do what they kind of already want to do. They want to brag about diversity and inclusion. They want to brag about how they helped people. But if it's going to cost them an extra hour in the day to do it, you know, they're going to they're going to pass and they're going to hire the next best person. So what we're trying to do is just make it where HR loves honest jobs because it makes their job extremely easy. Thank you, Stephen. And I think Emma's going to cut me off. I think we're running out of time, but I just wanted to say I, I'm super impressed with um, your story and honest jobs and um, have done a bunch of work on um, reentry and recidivism in one of my past lives. And um the other key point that I know you know, but want to make sure everyone knows that if you can get formerly incarcerated individuals into the workforce, they are hugely less likely, and I can't remember the stat, but far less likely to recidivate or to end up back um, in prison. And so, you know, you're helping the community, you're you're driving economic development, and and you're changing those people's lives. So, congrats. Yeah, thank you, Laura. Yeah, we are out of time, but thank you so much, Harley, for joining us. And lastly, we are going to turn to Chris Motley with Mentor Spaces for our final pitch today. Hello. Can you all hear me and see me okay? Cool. Thank you so much. Uh, so Harley, great job. It's always hard to follow you. But uh, my name is Chris Motley, founder and CEO of Mentor Spaces. Uh, we built a, a community-driven mentorship platform to really support uh, diverse talent and attraction. Uh, since we're in the, 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 the mode of sharing baby pictures, I guess I have to share some of mine. Uh, uh, grew up in the south side of Chicago uh, to a teenage mom, but through a series of relationships and really conversations with people who really helped me understand the world around me, I was able to um, go off to college, have a nice career at Goldman Sachs, and become an entrepreneur presenting for you today. And it really just came down to um, having the right mentors. Um, and that is the inspiration behind uh, creating mentor spaces. Uh, in fact, LinkedIn presented uh, research that shows you know, where we go to school, where we grow up, who we surround ourselves around in the workplace, workplace, give us a 12 times advantage in navigating our careers. So when you're a person of color and you simply don't know people in career paths that you may aspire to have or even career paths you don't even know exist, it's almost like saying you're at a 12 times disadvantage when navigating your career. And this network gap is really one um, that we hope to solve with Mentor Spaces. And you know, despite companies spending $8 billion annually on DE&I um, initiatives, uh, we still hear from some of our customers that um, existing solutions simply don't work um, and fail to consistently attract and retain underrepresented talent. And when you think about my narrative, even when you think about the narrative that Harley shared, um, part of that um, means that the solutions don't really speak exactly to the problem. And you know, being an underrepresented person myself, especially early in my career, you ultimately lack the confidence as well as the network necessary to, to navigate. And so when we think about strategies that companies pursue um, to solve these problems as it relates to talent attraction and retention, they're just overly transactional. They're overly focused on candidate assessment as opposed to relationship building. And they really don't meet people where they are, which I think we all can agree in the, the COVID environment uh, is very, very important. And that's just very simply the mobile device. And this uh, impacts our customers who are Fortune 500 organizations when it comes to um, brand value, cost per hire, all the way down to employee engagement and retention. Um, the current landscape, um, I know I'm preaching to the choir a little bit on this, but it, it goes to show sort of what we have to think about 
and building the product that we built to solve this problem. You know, many students, uh, whether they are attending a boot camp, a traditional college or university, they just don't know what they don't know. And we have this um, huge uh, part of the workforce that's already activated who actually want to help, but they just don't know how, and they have limitations on their bandwidth. And then while the events of, of the summer of 2020 have certainly increased the budgets and the focus on DE&I, the goals and expectations far outweigh the resourcing. So having a scalable solution is super, super important. And, and that's really where Mentor Spaces comes in. Uh, what we've built is an approach to facilitate conversations between existing employees and prospective candidates that are trying to find their way in the world of work. And when you really think about mentorship, that's effectively what it is. It's, it's just a conversation with someone who can help um, you accomplish your goals. Uh, so the way that it works, uh, we create sort of real estate uh, representing our customers within the Mentor Spaces ecosystem. Uh, our customers either invite candidates or previous applicants uh, to the community where they can easily care, clarify their goals. Uh, we then match those individuals with mentors who lead groups or spaces that are focused on soft skill development, functional roles, industry topics that really serve as a base camp, so to speak, for conversations. And then finally, we facilitate conversations both in one-on-one -on -one and group formats, which is ideal for scale, to really help demystify career paths and build that confidence and social capital necessary for underrepresented populations to attain um, uh, relevant careers. For employees at our customers, who oftentimes are the mentors, um, we make it very easy for them to, to specify uh, what they're comfortable supporting others with. And, and most importantly, we capture time commitments, and we integrate directly with their calendars across all calendaring pro, um, uh, technologies to help you know, capture inventory of their time, so to speak, which we then make available for mentees to book one-on-one -on -one and group sessions. Uh, ultimately, our position is um, companies will always have goals as it relates to talent attraction and retention, and mentorship is the strategy to cost-effectively accomplish those goals on a continuous basis year-round, as opposed to episodic time-bound uh, experiences that define the traditional approach to, do, to solving this problem. Um, as talent uh, are nurtured through uh, group sessions about various topics in voice, video, and chat, um, it provides a great engaging environment for companies to target their opportunities, internships, et cetera, uh, for individuals or cohorts of individuals who can be a good fit. Ultimately, mentorship programs that are leveraging our technology um, continuously cultivate talent, as I mentioned. Uh, they experience our proven process for turning their employees into uh, ambassadors for their organizations in a way that doesn't um, require a lot of time commitment, uh, virtually no admin, and we're available both in iOS, in Android, and in the browser. Ultimately, what makes us different is what we call community-driven mentorship. And what that basically means is that, well, everybody's a mentor if they have a lived experience that someone would value, and everyone can uh, benefit from mentorship as they grow in their careers. And by allowing people to shift between playing a mentor and a mentee, continuous value is being created and delivered um, in the user experience itself. Ultimately, the value we deliver to our clients is targeted employer branding, um, pipeline cultivation on a role-by-role -role basis, and analytics uh, as it relates to employee engagement, sentiment, which is tied to retention. Uh, the value drivers we support are everything from hiring effectiveness and conversion to reduce turnover and uh, reduce time to fill positions, which we estimate to deliver about one and a half million dollars of value annually um, at a fraction of the cost. Uh, when we think about purely from a cost per hire perspective, um, the TAM to be seven billion, much higher when you think about employee engagement and branding. Um, and part of how we sort of fuel our go-to-market motion is by offering our technology at almost no cost to legacy nonprofits, 
uh, community organizations and MSIs where we facilitate mentorship between their populations, such as students and alumni, um, lowering our user cost of acquisition, but also establishing more credibility among uh, prospective customers. Um, we partnered with some of the largest nonprofits in the country, um, focusing on our demographic. And some of our customers are well-known brands, um, and we have a pretty healthy funnel as well. Right now, our current reach is about 50,000 community members, uh, 500 prospective customers, and we have a half a million dollars in committed ARR. Um, as I mentioned, our funnel is pretty robust. Um, we really have a flexible approach of starting off with companies at around the $25,000 to $50,000 contract value and then scale within the organizations as we expand the scope and size of our mentorship program. Um, uh, one of the things that I like the most uh, is that it works. Uh, so we're seeing more than 50% retention on a month by month basis, an average of 35 minutes in our app each month. Every session is 30 minutes. So we sort of engineer our own success there. And we're getting uh, consistently over 90% uh, participant um, satisfaction uh, among both mentors and mentees. Uh, finally, we integrate with some of the leading HRIS systems uh, that allow for easy onboarding. Uh, success factors is the first one that we've done, and we'll continue on to integrate with Workday and Oracle, um, you know, guided by our prospective customers. Uh, again, this allows for uh, us to be up and running with our customers in, in as little as four weeks. It makes it very easy for mentees or mentors from that organization uh, to be uh, on the app and productive. From a comp competition standpoint, you know, one way to look at this is that most mentorship technologies exist within the sort of four walls of a company, which basically presents a barrier for the people who need mentorship the most. And, and the mentorship programs that exist outside of the organizations tend to be in nonprofit organizations uh, who don't leverage technology that we bring to bear. Uh, so we use mentorship to focus on the talent acquisition motion, um, allowing for the people who need it most to have access to it, uh, to, develop, to develop both confidence and social capital necessary um, to get higher paying jobs. Uh, when we think about sort of our theory of change, it really just comes down to that conversation. Uh, I think we've all had a conversation with the person that could have been life-changing. And so as long as we continue to facilitate conversations between experienced and less experienced individuals, um, you know, you can equate that to uh, salary uh, increases that you get from having more access and social capital and the network to attain higher paying jobs. And when we think about our current reach, um, that's 600 million in value that we can deliver um, in the next few years. Uh, I think it also is a competitive advantage when you think about the great resignation uh, because we're able to attract some really uh, talented individuals to our team who are just passionate about this problem and get to build cutting edge technology to facilitate mentorship at scale. Uh, so thank you so much for the time. Uh, feel free to get in touch uh, to learn more. And I guess we will open it up for questions. Thank you. Great, any initial questions from our panelists? I'll jump. Um, great. great. Great pitch, Chris. Uh, I'm also from Southside Chicago, so. Um, <laughs> We're very proud Southside. people. <laughs> yeah. um, which is actually East Side if you look on a map, but we'll talk about that later. Um, <laughs> what's, the, what's the best uh, success story that you have, you know? with your product impacting, you know, yeah. real folks. Well, really quickly, I, I now see the notes. Sorry, I ran over a little bit there. I thought we were a little bit longer, but but thanks for the question. And uh, so really we had a guy, Vaden, who was in the application, um, who connected with the mentor one-on-one. -on -one. They had maybe three or four conversations um, and Vaden got an internship like four months later. And, and we all know that internships are leading indicators to full-time jobs. And not only is that the success story for, for the organization and this individual, 
uh, it was very easy as a leader of this company to say, hey, guys, let's do this a million more times. Uh, this is what success looks like. And that just was a gratifying thing um, to lead a team of people who can see what success looks like as we continue to build scale in our solution. You may have mentioned this um, in one of your metrics focus slides, but just curious on kind of the pairings to date. How many, how many you know, students and professionals have you served with providing kind of a connection to a mentor? Yeah, it's it's because you have group uh, mentorship or group conversations and one on one. It's really not about the pairings. Uh, it's about the time people are spending in the application and uh, the feedback that they're providing as a result of those conversations. I had a conversation earlier with uh, a prospective customer, huge brand. I know we're going to close them. And they said, well, when does this end? And I'm like, well, it never ends. You always need mentorship. And so one of the things that I think are the most important metrics is the fact that people come back and use it, um, which is a much more uh, uh, predictor and leading indicator of some of those lagging indicators that we will attract from an impact perspective, but also from conversion rate into jobs, as I mentioned earlier, um, and even promotion rate when someone gets that job by virtue of conversations on our application. I'm so glad you um, went there because that's kind of what I was thinking. I, I love that whole concept of everyone's a mentor, everyone's a mentee. I find that in my own life. In fact, people I mentored, I now ask for advice on things all the time. And so the, the tables have turned. Um, and so that was going to be part of my question. And maybe you answered it, but you could say a little bit more. Um, how do you, you know, how do you land and expand with some of these big corporate clients? And is there an ability yeah. to move this into career development rather than the kind of front end of the pipeline? Yeah, so we, we it's a great question. So to handle the second question first, the front end of the pipeline is important because they, we close deals more quickly. Um, what we're finding, some of our customers, especially those who start off on the front end, they say, can we also use this for interns or can we use this for um, our frontline hourly employees to get them to more salary positions? Or can we use this for entry level folks and get them to more managerial positions? And the answer is yes, yes, and yes. Um, and, and so the way we would start is we would go to a company and say, hey, let's just partner with your, your Black or Latinx um, employee resource group. They almost always have goals related to leadership development as well as pipeline development, which they both can do with mentor spaces. And then it sort of creates oh, let's do it to the Latinx ERG. Let's do it to the working moms or whatever the thing is of the day. Um, and that's how we sort of expand out. And that's all from a recruiting motion. Ultimately, it gets into, hey, let's do this internally for these five lines of business where we have an existing mentorship program, but it's a huge administrative load. It's super manual. Most mentorship programs <laughs> are off of Microsoft Excel. And, and, and so it's not even about, even from a competition standpoint of how many people are doing this, it's the fact that 90%, 95% of Microsoft Excel, and I think our community-driven approach allows for that one program that could be 50 grand a year, expanding within an organization to run all of their programs where you have this, this you know, real-time measurable feedback um, and tie, a direct tie to the return on investment. Great. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank Wonderful you. Presentation. I enjoyed it. Well, we have one minute left for the session. So in closing, I just wanted to thank all of our audience members for sticking with us for a long pre uh, presentation and session here. But hopefully you enjoyed hearing both some perspectives from our investor panelists, as well as our entrepreneurs and learning more about their companies. So if there are any synergies with our firms, TCEF, EIF, Bronze, SJF, or any of the companies you heard from, Go Coach, Faruna, Honest Jobs, or Mentor Spaces, please feel free to reach out and we will be happy to make some connections. But again, a big thank you to the audience and to our panelists and entrepreneurs for joining us. Sasha, Steven, Laura, thank you so much and look forward to working with you in the future. Thanks, Emma. Thanks, SoCap. Thank you, Emma.